That one you got to ask Shada. Hmm? What? The most common causes of uh, pangolin deaths in Singapore is from uh, roadkill accidents. So the most common injuries would be uh, traumatic injuries, so fractures, uh, broken bones, things like that. Um, yeah, so that's what we are mainly looking for. And then when we open the or dissect the body, then we can see if they actually have any underlying conditions, like whether they had some infection going on. So for fracture, sometimes you can feel it if it's in an abnormal position or you can feel the the bones creaking against each other. So we call it crepitus. But anyway. Yeah, no, I think this guy got ran over, man. Over the spine. Well, pathology is important because it allows us to study why the animal was sick or why the animal died. Uh, and in our collection and our parks, it's especially important for us so that it can improve our husbandry or our medical uh, services for the animals here as well. And why you got to ask Shada? Hmm? What? Uh, what do you say? What, what do you do pathology as a career? Oh yeah, I think this is... Why? He's holding a knife. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, because I, I, I like problem solving. Uh, this is actually a just just problem solving process because you want to find out what happened to the animal and everything is in front of you. So a lot of information in the carcass, which if you learn it and you know how to see them, how to identify them, then you can get all these puzzles to together then you make a big picture to see if, to find out what happened to this animal. It's a very steep learning curve because you only cover a very brief uh, training session in vet school. Um, so most of your training you get on the job. I think it's getting uh, familiar with all the different species of animals. And some species have special features to them. Yeah. Yeah, so we then, but the more we do, the more we get familiar with them. And then we know what is unique for them. So sometimes when the clinicians are doing like endoscopy or an ultrasound and they're not familiar with the anatomy, we can help them with some advice and we can consult them like where, where we think the organ is most likely to be, whether they are looking at the right place, right location. Oh, my mom always tell me, why you want to do this? <laughs> like, oh, do I? I never try to get used to it, I just used to it. <laughs> yeah. I'm really, I'm really, really okay with that. Yeah, I've done a lot of like rotten animals. Animals is crawling with a lot of maggots. All that kind of thing, is it okay? Uh? I think his sense of smell is not very good, also. Yeah, no, that's another thing. Lucky him. <laughs> not only sense of smell, sense of taste as well. <laughs> the main purpose of biobanking is to keep uh, tissue 
and its DNA. So in future, if there ever is a need to, let's say, revive a species which is very very rare or hopefully not um, then there's actually enough genetic material to to enable these processes so right now cloning or reviving animal species is not so easy it's not such a straightforward uh, process um, but maybe in future the technology will get better so we are keeping all this um, for the future yeah because we never know especially for the critically endangered animals whether we will lose them soon, eventually. So it's always foresight to keep uh, tissue samples now. Yeah. So we are going to keep our biobanking samples in our freezer, which is at minus 80 degrees Celsius. It's very, very cold, uh, which is excellent for preserving uh, tissue and blood samples. Um, so it goes into a little box here that's labelled for cryobanking. And we wear special gloves because it's so cold and we want to protect our fingers. And that goes in there. And it's labelled with the case number, the species of the animal, and the organ that was taken. And then we put it back. And then we keep it there until we need it. So, for future generations! <laughs> okay, come, let's put this back. Right now we're going to cut it into smaller pieces so that we can put it into a little cassette and process it for cutting. So we have to take parts of the side, parts of the center of the mass and parts where normal becomes abnormal so that when we look at it under the microscope we can actually see the extent of the tumour, how big it is, whether it's invading the normal tissue at the side. So that's what we look out for when you know when we can look at it under the microscope so this is just um, one of the many steps before we can get to look at it under the microscope <laughs> This one, the, the paraffin is in room temperature. So the, this paraffin melt around 55 degrees Celsius. Like you go to Shabu Shabu, you, you eat the sliced meat. All this slice is actually from frozen meat, a big chunk of frozen meat. And then, then it, because it's hot enough, so they can use the device to cut very thin slice for you. If it's too soft, every cut you will drag. So, and also one thing is when it's too soft, when you cut, it won't be evenly, uh, the even, the, we won't get even thickness. Yeah, some part will get dragged and just push more, then it'll get thicker or thinner behind. So that's why I always, we always need to like use, either use ice or you put it in the freezer. Then you get it hard enough so you can get an even cut. 